with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary, the best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer them. Amen. My friends, our program today and all of our future programs, which are brought to you by Mary's Littlest Children, is dedicated to St. John Paul II. My friends, we previously consecrated our ongoing weekly program to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Conception, the Mother of God. Now we, Mary's littlest children, briefly renew that consecration with these words. Totus tuus ego sum, et omnia mea tuus sunt. I am all yours, Immaculata, and all that I have is yours, including, and especially, this radio program entitled, Jesus via Mary. Before we begin, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to keep a pen and paper handy, unless you're driving a vehicle, to jot down some information that we'll give you later on in the program. There's bound to be something of interest to you. We'll also give you a link whereby you can access all of our programs, past, present, and sometimes even future, in order to catch up on things if you wish. As you probably know by now, our email address is to Jesus via Mary at AOL.com. And you can write to us at any time with questions or comments. We only ask that you do so with respect. Today, my friends, we're going to continue talking about Eucharistic adoration and the importance of it. Uh, listen to these words from St. John Paul II. The Church and the world have great need of Eucharistic adoration. Jesus waits for us in this sacrament of love. Let us be generous with our time in going to meet him in adoration and contemplation, full of faith. And let us be ready to make reparation for the great faults and crimes of the world. May our adoration never cease. He wrote that in 1980. Then in 1996 he wrote this, and this is really powerful. Closeness to the Eucharistic Christ in silence and contemplation does not distance us from our contemporaries. In this case, contemporaries means the people around us. If we're intent on Christ, we're not talking to them. But it doesn't distance us from them. I'll go over that again. Closeness to the Eucharistic Christ in silence and contemplation does not distance us from our contemporaries, but on the contrary, makes us open to human joy and distress. In this case, the Pope's talking about the human joy and distress of other people all over the world, because there is joy in some places, and there's much distress in others. So, on the contrary, it makes us open to human joy and distress broadening our hearts on a global scale. Through adoration, the Christian mysteriously contributes to the radical transformation of the world and to the sowing of the gospel. Anyone who prays to the Eucharistic Savior draws the whole world with him and raises it to God. We're going to continue, but I first want to digress just a little bit. 
and ask you if you know the four keys to heaven. If you don't know them off the top of your head, don't worry. I'm going to tell them to you. The first key is the sacrifice of the Mass. The second key is the rosary, praying the rosary. The third key is wearing the scapular, the brown scapular. And we'll talk about that more in another program. And the fourth key is the way of the cross. Now our Lord on several occasions has said to different mystics over the years that after Mass, when at all possible, we should not leave the church immediately. We should spend about 15 minutes with him. I realize that this is not always possible, especially if you have to dash out and go to work. But if you can find the time and have the desire, one way to spend that 15 minutes with Christ after Mass, after having received him in the Eucharist, is to pray the Stations of the Cross. It only takes about 15 minutes. Listen to these promises that our Lord gave to a mystic regarding people who pray the way of the cross. There are a number of them here, and I'm going to read them to you. And they're powerful, and that's why I'm reading them. I'll grant everything that's asked of me with faith when making the way of the cross. I promise eternal life to those who pray from time to time the way of the cross. I'll follow them everywhere in life, and I'll help them, especially at the hour of death. Even if they have more sins than blades of grass in the fields and grains of sand in the sea, all of them will be erased by the way of the cross. Now we have to note, this promise doesn't eliminate the obligation to confess all mortal sins, and this before we can receive Holy Communion. Those who pray the way of the cross often will have a special glory in heaven. I'll deliver them from purgatory, indeed if they go there at all, the first Tuesday or Friday after their death. I'll bless them at each way of the cross, and my blessing will follow them everywhere on earth and after their death in heaven for all eternity. At the hour of death I won't permit the devil to tempt them. I'll lift all power from him in order that they'll repose tranquilly in my arms. If they pray it with true love, I'll make each one of them a living ciborium in which it will please me to pour my grace. I'll fix my eyes on those who pray the way of the cross often. My hands will always be open to protect them. As I am nailed to the cross, so also will I always be with those who honor me in making the way of the cross frequently. In other words, our Lord is going to be nailed to us. No one can remove him from us by making the way of the cross often. They'll never be able to separate themselves from me, for I'll give them the grace never again to commit a mortal sin. At the hour of death, I'll console them with my presence, and we'll go together to heaven. Death will be sweet to all those who have honored me during their lives by praying the way of the cross. My soul will be a protective shield for them, and will always help them whenever they have recourse to me. These are very, very powerful, my friends. And it only takes about 15 minutes to do this. If we could do it each day after daily Mass, wouldn't that be wonderful? Do it as often as possible. Remember the promises. And you know, it's not necessary to do it because of what our Lord is promising. Do it because he feels that it's so important for us to do it for him and with him that he makes these promises available. Okay, let's continue now, and we're going to talk some more about Eucharistic Adoration. What is Eucharistic Adoration? 
Understood simply, Eucharistic adoration is adoring or honoring the Eucharistic presence of Christ. In a deeper sense, it involves the contemplation of the mystery of Christ truly present before us. During Eucharistic adoration, we watch and wait. We remain silent in His presence, and we open ourselves to His graces which flow to us from the Eucharist. By worshiping the Eucharist, the Eucharistic Jesus, we become what God wants us to be. Like a magnet, the Lord draws us to Himself and gently transforms us. In its fullest essence, Eucharistic adoration is God and man reaching out for each other at the same time. At the moment of consecration during the Mass, the gifts of bread and wine are transformed by means of transubstantiation into the actual body and blood of Christ at the altar. This means that they are not only spiritually transformed, but rather are actually substantially transformed into the body and blood of Christ. The elements retain the appearance of bread and wine, but are indeed the actual body and blood of Christ. This is what is meant by real presence, the actual physical presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Christ instituted this sacrament of the Eucharist in order to remain with mankind until the end of time. Because as Catholics we believe that Christ is truly and substantially present in the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament is given the same adoration and devotion that is accorded to Christ. In other words, my friends, whether we're adoring Jesus in the tabernacle or in the monstrance, that is really Him. So whether we saw Him up there with our physical eyes in His human divinity, and He was sitting on the throne, how would we act? We should act the same way when we adore Him in the Blessed Sacrament. At the beginning of the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, a priest or deacon removes the sacred host from the tabernacle and places it in the monstrance on the altar for adoration by the faithful. Monstrance is the vessel, the container, used in the church to display the consecrated Eucharistic host during Eucharistic adoration or benediction. The word monstrance comes from the Latin word monstrare, meaning to expose. It is known in Latin as an ostensorium. When a consecrated host is placed in the monstrance, it is said to be a solemn exposition. When the monstrance contains the sacred host, the priest does not touch it with his bare hands, but instead holds it with a humeral veil, a wide band of cloth that covers his shoulders, humera, and has pleats on the inside in which he places his hands. At all other times the reserved sacrament is kept locked in the tabernacle so that the faithful may pray in the presence of the sacrament. Jesus waits for us in the Blessed Sacrament. He waits for our little acts of faith and adoration, of love, thanksgiving, repentance, reparation, and charity, the acts that we can offer Him as we contemplate His Divine Majesty in the Blessed Sacrament. St. Alphonsus Liguori wrote, Of all devotions, that of adoring Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the greatest after the sacraments, the one dearest to God, and the one most helpful to us. The Eucharist is a priceless treasure, but not only celebrating the Eucharist, also by praying before it, outside of Mass, we are enabled to make contact with the very wellsprings 
of grace. Pope John Paul II in one of his homilies said, It is pleasant to spend time with him, to lie close to his breast like the be beloved disciple, referring there to St. John the Apostle at the Last Supper when he laid his head on Jesus' sacred heart. If in our time Christians must be distinguished by the art of prayer, how can we not feel a renewed need to spend time in spiritual conversation, in silent adoration, in heartfelt love before Christ present in the Most Holy Sacrament? Day and night Jesus dwells in the Blessed Sacrament because of his infinite love for us. Jesus gives us his body to eat so that he can nourish us, strengthen us, and give us his own life. And lest we be blinded by his glory, he humbles himself to come to us in the humble species of bread. This is a quote from Matthew 28.20 Behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of time, because and this is from Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and constant is my affection for you. How, much, how must we respond? Through our worship and recognition of him in the Eucharist, he is calling us to faith that we may come to him in humility. Are you tired because of the burden of your duties, because of frustration due to unsuccessful projects, because many misunderstand you? Are you heavy laden with guilt from past sins? Are you trying to find hope and meaning in life? Do not lose heart. Abandon yourself to Jesus in this sacrament of love. He will refresh you. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more you will come away feeling renewed and healed. Miracles of conversion, peace, discovery of vocations, answers to prayers, physical healings, and many other wonderful things happen where and when the Lord Jesus is adored in the Blessed Sacrament. They are the gifts that point to the Almighty Giver and testify to His real presence in the Blessed Sacrament. Let us love being with the Lord. There we can speak with Him about everything. We can offer Him our petitions, our concerns, our troubles, our joys, our gratitude, even our disappointments, our needs, and our aspirations. Above all, we can remember to pray, Lord, send laborers into your harvest. Help me to be a good worker in your vineyard. When asked what would save the world, Mother Teresa of Calcutta replied, My answer is prayer. What we need is for every parish in the world to come before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament in holy hours of prayer. We grow spiritually with each moment that we spend with Jesus. Through our adoration, Jesus calls us to a personal relationship, to become his friends and disciples, to remain in him. That's known as divine intimacy, to remain in him. To remain in his love by keeping his commandments. He promises that those who remain tightly bonded to him will bear much fruit and their joy will be complete. For without him, we can do nothing. Through this friendship, we are inspired and strengthened to take on life's challenges, to carry our daily cross with a new attitude, to become a new creation, and more and more like Jesus. Eucharistic adoration is an affirmation of our faith. Through this vigil of prayer, we give witness to our belief that God is truly dwelling with his people. The Eucharist is the sacrament of unity, Jesus unifying his people. Through the personal love that one shares with the Savior, 
one is more able to grasp the reality that we are the whole body of Christ. Prayers as a community, especially intercessory prayers for the needs of the community and the world, help to build a civilization of love to transform the world. The prayers that we can say draw the world and everybody in the world closer to Christ and to God the Father for his blessing. Indeed, earth is joined to heaven each time we are united with the saints and angels in extolling God who in worship we see if not with the sight of eyes then with the eyes of faith. We are called to abide in the Eucharistic presence of our Lord like the saints and angels do in heaven and they behold the glory of God and sing his praise the saints and angels wait upon the Lord and do his will in all things. Their presence magnifies the Lord. They also intercede for us before the Lord. When we look upon the sacred host, we look at Jesus, the Son of God. Do we see him in all his glory and majesty? Do our lips proclaim his praise? Do our souls magnify the Lord, making him clearer? more in focus and larger to others around us? Do we place the needs of others before him? Are we open to the will of God and strive for perfection in our spiritual lives so that we too may one day join the company of saints in heaven? It is at this moment when we are most intimately in communion with God that we experience a taste of heaven, a foreshadowing of what it will be like when, by God's grace, we enter into everlasting life. Indeed, this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks upon the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Him I will raise up on the last day. In John 21.16, Jesus asked Peter the question that will determine his whole life. Simon, son of John, or Simon bar Jonah, do you love me? Jesus is asking each of us the same question. Do you love me? Those of us who have an experience of love know that true love sets no conditions. It simply loves, and yet it must be nurtured and nourished by intimacy, closeness, or regular contact. It is the same with time spent in divine intimacy with Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. How can our encounters with the Lord not call us to fall more and more in love with Him? As we yield to such love, it will prompt hunger for Scripture and the sacraments as we seek to know and experience Him on a deeper level. It will make us remember Him throughout the day inspire us to do little things just for him and try to make ourselves more attractive to him by lives of purity and holiness and yet we should not feel discouraged if we cannot love him fully because Jesus assures us that he will always love us with a love that surpasses all my friends it is awesome to sit in front of Jesus in adoration. I think the words that I've just spoken to you just kind of sum it all up. I'm going to leave it right there. I, I can't improve upon what I've already said, which I got from a website. I want to share this with you. Our Lord once told a mystic, St. Bernard, who asked our Lord what his greatest unrecorded suffering was. And our Lord answered him, I had on my shoulder while I bore my cross on the way of sorrows a grievous wound which was more painful than the others and which is not recorded by men. Honor this wound with your devotion and I will grant you whatsoever you ask through its virtue and merits. And in regard to all those who shall venerate this wound, I will remit to them all their venial sins and will no longer remember 
their mortal sins. And here's a prayer to the shoulder wound of Christ. O loving Jesus, meek Lamb of God, I, a miserable sinner, salute and worship the most sacred wound of thy shoulder, on which thou didst bear thy heavy cross, which so tore thy flesh and laid bare thy bones as to inflict on thee an anguish greater than any other wound of thy most blessed body. I adore thee, O Jesus most sorrowful, I praise and glorify thee and give thee thanks for this most sacred and painful wound, beseeching thee by that exceeding pain and by the crushing burden of thy heavy cross to be merciful to me, a sinner, to forgive me all my mortal and venial sins and to lead me on towards heaven along the way of the cross. Amen. We all have our crosses, our brothers and sisters. And we talked earlier in the program about praying the way of the cross. The graces from praying the way of the cross will help us to carry our own. Next week we're going to start talking about new and divine, the holiness of the third millennium. What is the new and divine holiness? We don't have time today to go into a lot of detail, but I'm going to give you a few excerpts. The new and divine holiness is a new and deeper participation in the interior life of Jesus Christ through the action of the Holy Spirit and Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin. Humanly speaking, the interior life of Jesus begins in eternity, where he is eternally aware of his generation from the Father. From eternity, Jesus recognizes his origin in the all-loving will of his Father. In short, and I can't go into this whole thing here because there isn't enough time left, the new and divine holiness comes down to this. Having firmly repented of your sins, give Jesus your will. Give Jesus your will. And ask him to make the will of the Father reign in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, this is the coming thing. It's the spirituality that you may have wished for and didn't even know existed. Let's pray together. Please open your minds and your hearts and we'll say this prayer together. O oh, Father, may your will be made known in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Reign in us through Mary. Holy Spirit, Mother Mary, unite us to Jesus that together we may live in the bosom of the Father, in the heart of the Trinity, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll have a lot more to say about this in our next program and in ensuing programs. And this book approaches the new and divine holiness from the standpoint of Scripture and the exemplars. Who are the exemplars? They are saints, people canonized or made blessed by the Catholic Church who have experienced, at least to some extent, the new and divine holiness. So we're taking, if you will, right from the teachings and the beliefs of the Church to present to you the new and divine, the holiness of the third Christian millennium, which the Holy Spirit longs to give us. All we have to do is accept it, take it, and practice it. My friends, we're about out of time, so if you will, join me in a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. See you next time. God bless.